Welcome to this super event uh, between Beyond Self-Discipline and the Pop-Up School. Uh, so a little bit about uh, Beyond Self-Discipline for those uh, who are coming from the Pop-Up School. This is uh, an experiment that's being launched out of the STOA with Daniel Kazanjian and myself, uh, a mixture of philosophical fellowships and mastermind groups uh, where we pursue what is most important and speak about what is most important at our knife's edge. And uh, a central aspect of it is cultivating what we're calling a DIY ecology of practices. And uh, Benita Roy's The Pop-Up School, uh, which I'm a student of, uh, I don't know if you want to jump in, uh, B, and speak briefly about it, um, about what The Pop-Up School is for people that are coming from uh, BSD today. Yeah, you know, beyond self-discipline, The Pop-Up School. Um, the pop-up school is, uh, like, I think this, an experiment in, um, in, uh, teaching, training, transmitting, and creating insights in post-formal learners. Um, and we have a different vibe than this. Uh, we tend to be like, uh, romper room for adults. We try to, um, uh, enjoy going to school with each other. It really does try to have a little bit of that feel. Uh, it's been very successful. People have had wonderful experiences there. So um, it's very easy to join. It's a Substack uh, subscription. And if you join, for example, in November as a paid subscriber, it's $40 a month, but you will have access to 12 hours of class. Everything that we've done, you can, are, is in the archives. Uh, so um, I don't like to necessarily advertise how to game the system, but um, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's who we are. And we're just finishing up a three-part series and we'll try to do something new in 2022. Awesome, and I highly recommend you checking out uh, the pop-up school and, and the Substack. Uh, a lot of fire posts happening there. Uh, and then I imagine more uh, collaborations between the STOA and Beyond Self-Discipline with the pop-up school will, will happen uh, in the future. Um, so yeah, maybe I can check on Daniel before we, uh, we start the session. How, how's it going, Daniel? How's your uh, BSD journey been so far? It's been, it's been really good. Um, and I think, uh, the thing that's been most salient to me in the last couple of days is uh, how cold my cold showers have been. Um, Cause you know, here in, here in Toronto, we're getting into the colder part of, of the fall, which basically is starting to become winter. And uh, I wanted to kind of share why I'm doing this crazy practice and you're doing it as well. I find that starting the day with a really cold shower uh, acclimatizes me to discomfort in a way that just stays with me throughout the rest of the day. So the rest of the day just becomes a lot easier. And because the water's been getting colder, um, I've felt a lot more resilient with a bunch of other things, like you know, things at work um, and different projects and my workouts and stuff. And I know you're doing that practice as well. So I'm curious to see how that's been for you, Peter. Yeah, a term I like to use in like previous mastermind settings and the one that came up yesterday in our, our gang is creating a reference point. Um, like when sort of like your consciousness is sort of like reducing, narrowing, and then it's like, do a movement that creates that reference point that you can kind of like it imprints on you. Uh, and then you can return to it. And I find cold showers are like that um, every day for me. Uh, when I'm not doing cold showers, it's like I have this, this tendency just to take these like <clears throat> hour long warm showers. And it's like, <laughs> my mind is wandering, but a cold shower like you get to the point and then, you know, like the consciousness feels sharp. So I really appreciate this practice and you sort of, um, inspire me to uh, run with it for this iteration of BSD. So that being said, we'll jump right into it. Uh, today's session, uh, The Origin <clears throat> of the Self, an Integrated Model with Benita Roy. I think the original title was like the best model of the self that yourself has ever seen. And, and Benita thought that was a little too much. <laughs> and, I, and I agreed. Um, so this was a model that uh, Benita introduced in her one of her pop-up school courses classes and it's one of the best descriptive models of the self that I personally have seen um, and it helped me concretize a lot of the various and oftentimes divergent conversations happening around the self from the various different modalities like the buddhistic schools psychotherapy schools philosophical schools and it's very clean sharp simple and it's like ah you know a lot, lot clicked for me um, 
and, and my intuition was that this model will be quite informative to um, in how we design our, our DIY ecology of practices. So I invited Benita today. Uh, she's going to present it in a moment for about 30, 45 minutes, uh, and then we'll have a Q&A or conversations um, for the remainder of time. We're here for 90 minutes in total. If you have questions anytime uh, in the chat, put it in the chat. During the Q&A portion, we'll call on you. Uh, we'll have a little pop-up school style as well when Benita is presenting. Uh, she, you can see she's going to share her screen right there. Um, feel free to jump off mute and just ask her a question if you need to clarify something. Do use your discernment, though. Um, just don't just jump in with, with random thoughts. Um, so that being said, uh, I will take in Benita and buckle up for getting my mind blown. Mm -hmm. I seem to be muted. You have to... you. Have to unmute the other Benita. Unmute the other Benita. This one. Uh, we can hear you though. You can. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Oh, that's right. You did the right way. It's very confusing. Okay. Um, so what are we gonna do? We're 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 also I guess this is BSD version zero. It's kind of experimental. So we're going to use this drafting board that I have here to. Um, derived to draw out the, uh, the model. And first, what I want to say, what is this? It's, it's called a model, but it's really what's called a heuristic, which is a way to organize a lot of material in a simple way. So when you ask a complex question, you're already using the same grammar. You're already using the same signposts. So it's a heuristic to... Um, it's a heuristic to organize us around, better organize us around a conversation. So one powerful heuristic you may be used to is the integral I, we, it's, right? And it's a very simple heuristic and it can get elaborated. So um, <clears throat> what I'm going to try to do is build this out um, just its bones. And then as the questions come up, I will try to situate the answers for the questions or the topics by building out more of the, um, the heuristic. So this basic model says that um, the self grows through expansion. So the self is not a linear model, but it expands, its capacity expands around three dimensions in three domains. So you imagine the growth is an expansion of capacity. And the three domains are along this line. This is a developmental, what we're used to thinking as developmental growth. And it's about being coherent across larger groups. So larger and larger groups. So my family, my community, my culture, more than one culture. If that's what this is a growth, it's a growth of what we might say a wider embrace. And it also has to do with your identity project. So you grow from your little me as a child to your identity grows into larger and larger spheres of embrace. And this is part of how we talk about the development of the self. And so we'll look at what, this, what the signposts are there. This is also called growing up in you know, Wilbur has this waking up, growing up, cleaning up. So these are all co consistent with this development, this trajectory of the growth of the self, of the growth of the self. In this trajectory, these are the structures that pre-constitute the self. These structures pre-constitute the self. 
So whereas these develop over your lifetime, these structures pre-constitute the self. And they're things like your body. You don't, you're not in the process of becoming your body over your lifetime. I mean, you can use that as a metaphor, but the body comes pre-constituted through the prior evolutionary history of the human. Your mind, the capacity to have a mind comes through the deep evolutionary processes of becoming human. And then there's other levels here. And as we move up here, we can see that as we go down here, these are called deeper universals. And what Wilbur calls, or in the traditions, they called them involuted. They're involuted into the self through this long evolutionary genealogy. And there's things, for example, like our animal nature is in this category. Our pro-social um, our pro-social behaviors comes from our animal nature. Our affective streams, there's three, there's six prime, seven primary affect streams in the neuroaffective anatomy of mammals. That comes from our animal nature. It comes preloaded. It's the prior evolutionary potentials that we are born with that then develop across a lifespan. Our biotic nature, we have a gut biome, we have an immune system that has come from the evolution of single cell animals. This is part of the origin of the cell is consistent with this deep evolutionary trajectory. <clears throat> so for example, a psychotechnology at this level is shamanism. It deals with the animal, animal realm. Ayurvedic medicine deals a lot with the biotic realm. Then there's the elements. All the psychoactive neurochemicals in our body come from the elements, the primary elements. The hemoglobin in our cell comes from a primary element that's made in the stars. So we have to honor the origins of the self come, they go, they go really, really deep. And Jung said, when you investigate the psyche, at bottom, you just get the world. You just get the universe. So this is the depth dimension in depth psychology. <clears throat> and then we'll go on to see beneath this is, we could say, the energy body, just primordial energy, and then the void. And you can see some of the Buddhist traditions, the meditation traditions are working with, for example, the body at the perceptual level or the body as energy or the body as elements. That, a lot of Taoism works with the body as elements. And then the void, of course, is the meditation on emptiness. So these practices, even though it takes higher and higher capacities to access them, you're accessing deeper and prior universals. What's important about this is that, for example, people are very different with, in their, their mind. Their, your mind is created by your culture. It's related to your culture. So we all have a mind, but the particular type of mind we have comes from our particular culture. Animals have minds also because what they can do like crows, but what the mind is, is the predictive simulation. So crows, for example, can look at a complex series of tasks they have to do to get food 
and you'll watch them they'll go back and forth and back and forth. And then when they're let out, they have maybe two or three of the steps already figured out because they've simulated predictively what they had the task, right? And that's what the definition of mind is. It comes from the higher animals. Predictive simulation we see in many, many animals and birds. But of course, the kind of mind we have is more sophisticated and the kind of mind we have is influenced by our culture. Okay, so another thing we can see is that this level here is highly unconscious. For most people, it's the deep unconscious, the deep unconscious of the body. And in here, we have the psyche, we'll define that. And this area here is the subconscious. So a lot of what's in your psyche, you may not be, may not be easily accessed, but it can be accessed. It's subconscious. And in the middle here, we have something very interesting because when we talk about consciousness and subconscious, Jung came up with this notion of the collective unconscious. But what he means is that it's unconscious to a certain size collective, right? So if I have a blind spot that I'm unconscious of and I relate to my friend, that's a dyad, it's next, it's a larger collective and they can help me make that conscious to me. Does that make sense? If I'm with a group of women and we, we have a blind spot about gender or sex or men, masculine and feminine, we can get to the next larger collective, which is both men and women together can help each other make their unconscious conscious to them. But if that group of men and women are all US Americans, there's a cult, there's, we're, we're collectively unconscious of other cultures. Right? So the way the consciousness, unconscious, making the unconscious conscious work is you always have to go to the next deeper, larger universal in order to process what's unconscious to that collective. Does that make sense? If it doesn't just say, please repeat or something. So this is, this is all stuff you know, I'm just laying it out for you. But what the, what's interesting about this model is that at a certain point down in here somewhere, the, there's something that's unconscious to the human species. It's beyond culture. It's beyond Western culture. It's beyond the human species. And the only way you can make that unconscious conscious is to get into relationship with the next deeper level, which is your animal nature. This is all the whole discussion around indigeneity and embodiment and these deeper kind of shamanic tasks are the psychodynamics to get beyond the species unconscious because that's how it works. The model says, that humans cannot solve their the problem with nature if they by themselves because it's collectively unconscious to the species and so you see a lot of interest in this right now and we do a lot of this in the pop-up school how to get at this and david's nodding his head because we just came through like some really cool, cool work. So this is how this, this whole level works. Um, and we'll, can, we can build out some more of this. For example, um, just trying to find a nice color. Uh, yeah, so the psyche 
has many different aspects to it. The psyche is the meaning making. The mind is the predictive. The psyche is the meaning making structure in people. And what we, what's in the psyche, if we wanna look at different structures, is we have what are called um, subpersonalities, transition, everything that's higher is more conscious, lower is less easy to access. We have subpersonalities, we have what's called transitional forms. So what do these mean? Subpersonalities are like, <clears throat> um, subpersonality is like when I get pulled, um, when I get pulled over by a cop, right? I know exactly what subpersonality to put on. Like I am not Bonnie Roy when I get pulled over by a cop. I take out of my, my suitcase, a certain mentality, a certain posture, a certain role, I put it on, I put it on, I can pick it right up and put it on, okay? This is how your subpersonality should be. They should be optional. They should, you should always be at choice with your subpersonalities. Now, we could talk forever about how this gets fucked up uh, through, you know, early childhood developmental affect regulatory problems. There's a lot we could talk about here, but we need to build out the whole model. What's deeper than this are called primary schema. Primary schema is very, very deep in the subconscious. It's almost unconscious. And what happens is when you're a child, you have to organize reality and you don't yet have a sophisticated mind. In fact, a three-year-old monkey, uh, you know, can, um, an 18 year old, an 18 month monkey can outperform a three-year-old child on predictive processing tasks. Our mind is slow to come. We have a long period where we have to organize reality through psychic structures. We don't have access to predictive processing. And what we and those the way we organize reality at that very early stage become our primary schema. So we organize the sense of a woman. I'm going to be just stereotypically. Uh, you know, 1950s family. You organize the sense of a woman and the breast with the concept mother, and then that builds the concept, the gender feminine. And then you organize a different thing with your other caregiver. And these masculine, feminine archetypes become primary schema that you build on later in life. The problem with primary schema is if you're not overcome with them, is you're limited to a very, very, very poor organization of reality. To see reality as masculine and feminine comes from the only way you could organize it when you were a toddler. And to hang on to that is extremely limited because the, the capacity to organize reality at that stage was extremely impoverished. And this is a whole spiel about, you know, uh, when people think they've married their father. No, the only the only thing that's the same about your father and your husband is that they're men. And you've organized this whole story around what that means, but you organized it with the child's very limited capacity. To, you couldn't understand anything about what was going on because you don't have predictive processing as a child, not until you're three years old. And then it's just coming online. So this is a kind of model that needs to inform a lot of psychotherapies that are like, don't know what they're talking about. So for example, 
primary schemas turn into what are called internal family systems. And people run around thinking they have like little policemen and little managers and little children and mothers and fathers inside their psyche. This is, this is kind of ridiculous. Okay, but that's the reality. Now up in here is an interesting place. I'm just gonna use a term that Michael Washburn used and this is called the, um, uh, uh, the core self, which is the evolutionary potential of the self. And what do I mean by that? The self has a, you wanna understand this model, the self is like, there's all this universal energy, right? And it has these three domains, let's say, and then the self is born and then it's trying to expand in these three domains. But what happens is something very interesting. So for example, nature is very experimental. It creates non-binary bodies. It creates you know, uh, a whole spectrum of gender and sexual pre preferences, right? And so those, that diversity is always trying to well up and the self is latent. That there's so much in what comes up that is latent potential. But at the level of culture, for example, it means that, uh-oh, no, that's not gonna make it into reality. Right? And so the latent self is always more full of potential than the culture wants it to, to manifest. Because the culture is a structure that is not evolving like the latent self. And so you, there's great, when I do this in my master's course, we have great videos of Lana Wachowski, for example, navigating the, and, and this puts the child in a pickle because the first time this energy comes up and even if your parent is the best parent in the world and they greet it with less than enthusiasm, you're in a pickle. Do I become the good boy or do I honor this authentic thing that's coming up in me? This is the great pickle of human existence. Because if I don't honor this, then I'm inauthentic. And this is something I will deal with for my whole life. I mean, this is the existential precarity of being a human. This happens to everyone. And so the process of how do I honor that? And this is what we call primary shame. Primary shaming is this, this not me, this, I mean, parents have to, have to train their children. They have to socialize their children into a culture. And so the, this dance, the more we understand how this works, and I'll give you a very simple example. Let's say a child, this authentic energy is coming up in them and they go like this and they break a vase. And let's say it's a really important vase to you. What do you do? You're not going to do nothing because you need to socialize your child. But there's a difference between why did you do that? And I point to the child. I point inside their inside as if I'm talking to a little intentional homunculus inside the child. And I say, why did you do that? And we all know what faces of children look like when you say that early on. They don't know why. They have no idea what you're talking about. But the more you do that, the more you put inside that child, a little bad boy, good girl, homunculus inside of them. This is how the psychic structures, the psychic dilemmas get put in there. What you could do instead is say, wow, what happened? So instead of having an egocentric inquiry, you have an allocentric inquiry. And that 
develops the mind instead of polluting the psyche with structures that have to be overcome once they're 40 years old or 50 years old or never overcome. So that's a lot of what happens in here. We could say then that the work here is to integrate to integrate these lower structures. The work here is to liberate the mind from the limiting conditioning of your culture. And the work here is to individuate the psyche. So these are all words you understand, but this is where they go. Now, here's something interesting that goes across this way. This is like, the identity project. And I have a whole cool thing to build this out, but we only have so much time. So the child is born first. I just use pronouns with this sense of mine, my body, my breast, my blankie, my, the mother is mine. This is a very deep structure. Even animals have it. The dogs have my bone, uh, the horses have my children. And it's associated with what are called egocentric perceptual processing. Right here, right there, that's mine. And it gets exacted into the human identity as mine. This is the first way the child relates to their identity. It's hardly an identity. At the mind stage, the way this is the show up. How do you show up? At the mind stage, you just show up as your behaviors. It's just impulse and behavior, that's all, that's how you show up. At the next level, there's a me. The me is, uh, um, the mind and the me are de developed through early childhood experiences and usually like the family. It starts in the family, you might say it's like a personality. And the interesting thing about the me and this is George Herbert Mead's work, also William James said the same thing, is the me you identify with, at a certain point in your life, you realize that you're, you can make your mother happy or smile, whatever, by something that appears in front of the other. I become, I understand that I am an image or an object to the other, and that I can make changes to the other by changing the me. So I'm an object, in the appearance for the other. This starts to happen around two years old, and this is where you get the terrible twos, because to test this theory, the child will do something like go and reach for the ice cream that they're not gonna want. And then, yeah, she got mad. I can do something with my body. I can appear in a certain way to affect the other. And this is the whole me stage. Right, the, but it's, it's an interesting phase because I say you lead with your me. Now the problem, and so the pro, and for children, it's tied to a role. So they can play the role of a bad boy, ha ha ha, or they can, they start to lie, they start to be deceptive. They can take the role, they play a lot of doctor because they understand a doctor appears in uniform in a certain way. So this is, the identity structure at this stage. Um, and and I, I can't get into the whole thing because I wanna do this out, but what's really sad is almost, I would say 80 to 90% of people in the US never get out of the me. Almost everybody leads with their me. This is really sad. This is not a very sophisticated structure. The me is just performing roles for, for feedback from the other. Almost everything you see online, almost everything in popular culture, almost everything that happens at school and everything that happens in the workplace is a me role structure. It's really sad. In the, it, it's, this is not the case in other cultures, but in Western culture, this gets agglutinated. Okay. Then if you're lucky, you get to the I, and the I has a sense of authentic agency. 
guy has a, a lodestone. A, uh, it, 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 it wants to perform its, its-ness, its I-ness. It has a sense of agency. It's not always wondering how it appears. It's driven by a sense of I-ness. A lot of people in our culture that have to move to I-ness have to hang out as narcissists for a while because it takes a lot of narcissistic energy to pull away from the me culture. And you see this, you see this toggle between young people. It's very difficult right now. And they get called narcissists. So you get called, you get called out because this is so unusual, this move in our culture today. Then we get to the we, most like uh, most kids, like if you're on a team, that's all team roles. Those are still me's. The we's are, is authentic collaboration. It's a collaboration. It's a unit of agency from a lot of collaborating eyes. You don't have true we's without individuated eyes. And this is the holy grail of all organizational science right now. How do we get independent, self-thinking, agentic eyes to collaborate into a true we? And this reminds me of Jonathan Rousen's uh, uh, work about we don't have a we in climate change. We need to change. Well, who is the we? There is the, the we is a, an a agent, a collective agency. So then we get to the us and the us is heavily related to culture. Whereas the we is a, an agent, a central collective agent, the us is more of a category, categorical identity because the scale is pretty high. So I don't, you know, I can say us women do this or us, Connect people in Connecticut do this, but we're not all collaborating with us. It's an emergent property of a category of people. So how do you get so that you can embrace this larger sphere of people you don't know, you don't actually collaborate to accept that you are embedded in these systems, Western society. How do you accept that you're embedded into Western society and you're complicit with it and you can embrace that? So that requires deep psychological processing of what is culture? How did our culture get like this? So the more you can clean up in here, the more you can awaken to these lower structures, the easier it is for you to authentically embrace the next larger structure. That's how it works. You have to do due diligence in the deep, uni deeper universals to authentically embrace the larger collective. Now here's where it gets really creepy. So then you get to, you can might say all of us, right? So global citizenship, all of us. And what we mean is all of us humans. So we're right here. Whoever has a human body is now all of us. And in most psycho-spiritual technologies, it's considered then that all the evolution, spiritual evolution and from there, is on the human branch of the tree. And you can get to something called consciousness as energy, right? So here's consciousness as energy. There's this huge, huge shadow. Somehow you skip in this spiritual position, you skip all of us, animals. And you skip all biotic realm. 
it's this huge shadow. And it's, to me, it's the reason why we just destroy the living earth. We can't pretend, oh, all of us animals, the earth is beautiful because we don't do our due diligence in this area. Just like to get from the me to the I, you have to understand your due diligence in your primary family system and what happened early on to get to the I. To get to the I, you have to understand your culture. You have to you have to work in this direction to authentically embrace in this direction. Otherwise, it's just bullshit. And then eventually, you know, you can get to something called the planetary and the cosmological. Authentically. There's a lot that happens right in this area, why it's very hard for us as modern people to move, to integrate these deeper levels. But I'm just going to wrap it up by saying um, what we can say then is that the ideal in this direction is to have alignment. That all the forces that pre-constitute me are aligned. So my mind is not working against my body. My body is not working against my psyche. My psyche is not working against my body, which happens all the time. Your psyche is making you sick. So what we want to have is deep alignment in this direction. We work toward larger coherence. I said this already in this direction. So can I be coherent with a person in another culture? Can I be coherent with a Trump supporter? Can I be coherent with the animals? Can I be coherent with the biome? And in this direction is a notion of congruence. Is the way I show up congruent with what I'm trying to cohere and, and align to? Or do I uh, just hide? And let's see, two more minutes. One, this notion of hiding is related to one other structure, which is called right here. It, it suppresses the latent self and that's called the gatekeeper self. AKA the ego. The ego is always saying, uh, you know, do I want to do wanna do that? Like, I don't know. You put some things into the good category and some things into the bad category. It creates all these splits. So what is a split? A split is like when we say, okay, we get, we get, you hear this all the time, not so much now in amongst this group, but you used to always say, well, our animal nature, you know, is like, is like savagery and, and it's animal nature to, to um, be savages and to, to fight and stuff like that. But in reality, all fidelity, all maternal care, all fidelity, uh, brotherhood, um, um, companionship, loyalty, all of these come from our animal nature. And what we do is we split. We say, okay, here's animal nature, and we this is the bad, and we say, that's not me. And then we say, this is good, and we say, that's not animal. And this whole layer in here is filled with splits, with the inability to align and be what is the sum total of the human condition. And those splits up here are called shadow. Okay, I'm done. Good time. Oh. There's a lot more. Like you, there's so much going in here. Like how the core self, the core self's project is to organize reality along self, other, and world. There's really good research. It's how that happens very early on. And of course, the core self is psychedelic. And when you reach pu puberty, you're not, and you have your first orgasm with someone, you're not sure who is the self and who is the other anymore. And then this goes on forever. Just a very interesting uh, project in here. But 
in every area, there's like, there's like, you can build out a lot of uh, stuff. Usually I do this over 30 hours in an intensive. So uh, that's what you get for 15 minutes. I'm sorry, I did my best. Well, I think first of all, everyone just give a round of applause because that was fucking brilliant. Um, and I think I, I should have kept the original title, the best model of self that ourselves have ever seen because that was just fucking um, brilliant, Benita. I just want to express like how grateful I am for having you in my life uh, to be exposed to stuff like this. Um, so we'll, we'll pivot to the Q&A portion now. I have some burning questions about three. Um, and I'll preface them by saying- Do you want that, to shut this off or will you, what do you want? How do you want to do this? It doesn't matter to me and just- Yeah, I sense you might probably want to write on it because some of the questions- okay. might evoke that um so to preface the questions like this is a descriptive model and at bsd we're looking for like proscriptive like guiding principles so finding that bridge i think this the purpose of the session uh feeling into it is finding uh not only being introduced to this brilliant model but finding the bridge between the descriptive and the prescriptive mm -hmm. um and something i wanted to ask first and i'll have a, a follow-up question on this is that when i emailed you originally when i, I saw this model i asked you where's the the daemon or the daemon fit into this and you said it wobbles between all these different selves so oh, that's, wondering... that's this that's this drawing hmm. right the universal energy is oh you know that's what i didn't say so uh this this what happens is so the universal energy is creating this pickle because you're growing up and the, no one in the world has ever seen a Peter Lindbergh. And it's, it's challenging you to follow the, your own path. And it's confusing because we also have to educate children into our own culture where we learn to adopt the roles that the, the culture gives us. But there are no models for you to follow. Your daemon doesn't, there's no model. You can't find, you can find some signposts, but you can't find yourself out there. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's this latency, this, this latent potential that is, is, does not align with anything that you'll see in other people or, and so it puts, it's, it's hard to understand what it's saying because nobody speaks its language. You haven't heard it before. It's hard to say, oh, I'm just gonna be that, right? So when you follow that versus just get a role in society, a prepackaged role, a lot of people do that. Um, that's different than the daemon or the thumos who has this tension because there's no other copy of it and you can't learn how to follow it the way you can learn everything else mm -hmm. and there's a risk you know these things are risky mm -hmm. um but it's just it's just um yeah in this model it's 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 that um and so a follow-up question i have to that and um i might stumble uh my way expressing this but so one of the challenges at uh, BSD, and you've read some of the material, you, you know what, what it's about, um, is the question, <clears throat> how to source our ecology of practice or like an individual ecology of practice consciously. And my working kind of answer, and please stress test this, is like the best ecology of practice is the one that gets us to the next ecology of practice. And a part, like a part of determining what that practice uh, is, is like kind of like tap into that demonic energy. Um, and the way I see it is like the ecology like temporarily converges, like depending where the person is at. Um, and then certain practices perhaps are not needed anymore. So they fall away because certain capacities are built. Uh, for example, they did like, you know, internal family systems and they got a little bit more individuated or something. And then a new ecology of practices co uh, converge, like perhaps some shamanic or Buddhistic ones. And like the, the challenge I have with the, the monastic setting is that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, everyone's on a, like a different place developmentally, like psychologically, they have different skill sets. And it's almost like a Procrustean bed approach. You're like, you're cutting off their arms and legs and trying to force fit them into a certain model. And my sense is that like more wildness in like an open way needs to be done. So like an ecology, like maybe like a deep code of the ecology of practices could be found or like what John Rubicki calls the meta ecology of practices. Um, so yeah, I'll pause there to see, see how that works. Yeah, I mean, 
it is a descriptive. I wanted, let me just say one thing before I forget and then I answer your question. So, cause I know that this, this resonated with you. Um, these are other words. This is your unique self. You wanna become your unique self. If you think of Gaffney's work, it, 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 it's in this kind of idea. Down here, um, this is called um, your true self or your true nature. And you see why it's more realistic because it points to nature. <laughs> so the word your true nature is the same word as nature, right? Makes sense. Whereas the Buddhists will say your true nature and they're pointing to some mumbo jumbo, whatever storehouse consciousness or something. That's not, this is not the way the model works. And this here is your, is what you would call your whole self. The sum total of the human condition is what we're trying to embrace here. So you no longer identify, you see in the human system, in the planetary system, you see yourself. That's, that's the holistic or unitary consciousness. And the other way to think about this is this is, uh, this is how you're embodied in this. So these are embodied practices. These are the systems you're embedded in. And this is the person you enact. You become this person by enacting it. So, um, so <clears throat> when you're talking about thumos or the will, right, just do it. In my opinion, this is because we just did this in the pop-up school. We talked about the will and I say the psyche is the place the will goes to die. And we process it. The will is from your animal nature. It's a wild, nobody talks about the will anymore. It's gone out of fashion since Nietzsche and fascism and Hitler and stuff. But the will is, is in this realm. It's in body work, it's in animal nature, it's in understanding the pickle. See, the pickle here is that culture, um, culture is where you start to have norms and taboos. And in the animal realm, there's no good and evil. They're only what Hart Hart called incommensurable goods. So it's good for the rabbit to get away from the fox so she can go home and feed her babies, but it's good for the fox to catch the rabbit so she can go home and feed her babies. In early tribal societies, you start to see the, you can see the evolution from here to here. I'm getting to your answer. <clears throat> And that is the first early tribal societies, they had rules. The first rules was who could eat who. So you see, for example, you could hunt this, but not that. You could pull this plant, but not that plant. You could eat some people. We did in early clans. We, could you, the forest people could eat the river people, but you wouldn't. So this is, and what they understood at that time is when the hunters went out to kill, let's say a lion or to kill something, they imagined themselves to be in a bardo realm in between. They were neither human nor animal because if they got to, if they were eaten, they were literally become an animal. It's literal. You're the lion eats you. So you now transmogrify into a lion, literally. This is not mythology. This is literally true, right? But then if you ate the animal, then the animal became human. This is the first sign of religion. These taboos are so deep that later on you get taboos around sex, but all cultures disobey the sexual taboos. But like our culture, you would never think of eating a monkey brain. The, 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 the Japanese can't imagine killing deer and we beat up on them because they kill whales. Eating, food taboos are very, very, very deep in 
this in, in our evolutionary history, okay? So when you're working with the animal realm, you're saying, well, is there good and bad? Is, if I really get in touch with my will and I get in touch with that, I get to this place, well, am I gonna have a split? Is it a good thing or a bad thing? And you get, you have to process through that question. Because in this area, it get, it's very, very interesting. Where do norms come from? Where to tell if nature doesn't have norms or you know, nature doesn't give a shit about you. Like, where does this come from? This is the real work when you're dealing with the daemon or the thumos um, or the will. Kierkegaard, Kierkegaard used the, the story in the Bible when. God tells Abraham to go kill your son. That's a sin. That's a horrible thing to do. But the, the commandment's coming up like thumos. And Abraham's wondering, is it a higher call? You know, do I go beyond good and evil? That's that whole thing. This is what, what's in this area. This is what's in this area. So the daemon and thumos is a kind of revival. It's a, it's, a, it's a revival of the will. And I know like you have people on your, on the stoa that are like body workers and crazy, you know, they're, they're, they work with the body in this kind of way. And, um, and yeah, this is something that, that is, that is interesting. In the path of school, we also looked at that kind of energy um, with the notion of the ocean and the, I don't know how to say, C-T-H-U-L-U, the, the thukhlo, the, the Viking energy of the deep ocean, the patient feminine energy that swells and is very patient, but will come and avenge the crimes on the earth. So, uh, yeah, that word, thank you. Um, so that's one way, I don't know if that's prescriptive enough, I'm not much of a prescriptive person, but that would be where the Thumos, the Thumosly lives. <laughs> uh, this, is, this is really helping me like realize my tendency to want to dunk on Buddhistic types. Um, so uh, yeah, it's pretty, pretty fucking cool. Um, so uh, I'm going to take in Daniel for a moment, uh, uh, in a moment. Um, but the last question I had um, was uh, in the original video, I saw this, you had another uh, element, the extended self. Uh, yes. I think it's quite relevant because BH BSD, we're cohering and, and getting uh, uh, our uh, right relationship with our college of practices via digital gangs. We're doing this online. So I was wondering if you could um, talk about yeah, that. Yeah, so... Um... This model, I've taught this model for years. And so I've only recently added the extended self. So we have here, psyche, mind, and body. One of the things that makes people much more successful than any other creature is that we extend our bodies into tools, right? So we, bicycles and cars and airplanes and hammers and stuff like that. We extend our minds into di uh, like calculators um, and, and computers. So this is, uh, so this is, well, this is an extension, whatever. I, I need a new, a new category. So the mind, and what's interesting is that the question is, is are we seeing the extension of the psyche, psyche into uh, virtual reality? Is that, is that what's, what we're looking at? So as we extend our body more into tools and the machines do that work, we become an information society. And as we extend the information and the machines do that work, because they're better, yeah, digital anima, like is the psyche going to be extended into technology or virtual reality? 
And then what kind of psyche is it? You know, we know what kind of mind we extend into our tools in our calculations. We extend the extractive capitalist scene mind into that. What kind of psyche is going to be extended into the, the virtual realm? So that's an interesting, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, the, it, it problematizes some of the way I work with this because it says just like the mind, the psyche is here to stay. And it's not, a, it's not a, ever going to be a problem of cleaning it up. It's a problem, it's going to be a problem of making it more and more blind to us. So just like the body is pretty much unconscious to most people, the mind, you have to have pretty, pretty tough metacognition now to see your mind. Uh, there is a chance in the future human, the psyche will be as deep in the stack as the body is to us now. And then you'll have another layer to have to work through. And that is called the matrix. When the psyche becomes as deep in the stack as our body is and now we'll be in the matrix. Yeah, this, this is model keeps on giving. Um, so I, I think I'm gonna stop sharing the screen now or the pop spotlight uh, and then I'm gonna take it with Daniel for a question um, and then uh, we'll pivot to uh, group questions. Hey, thanks so much for that. Um, I think it's gonna take a couple days for me to internalize some of this and let it sink in. Um, and I'm kind of groping around in the dark for a question here, but I, I'll start riffing and I think it'll come up. You, you had a few words there, um, individuate, integrate, and liberate. I think those are the words, and maybe those are placeholders for, for the work, right? Yeah. If somebody were to take this model and try to do something with it, maybe those words act as like signposts for what to do. And so I was trying to think in the spirit of BSD, what is... I guess my question is like, what is the fundamental unit of that work? And I'm going to riff a little more to, so you know what I mean. Um, if I were to try to summarize this to somebody in like 30 seconds who wasn't here, I'd say it was a really cool model about um, maybe, maybe like a map for how to make things more conscious or um, Jordan Hall in, in last week's session said, our task is conscious evolution. And so when I think about that as, as like an individual, you know, waking up in the morning faced with all the vicissitudes of life and all the, my responsibilities. And I think like, okay, what is that basic move? Um, what is like the bicep curl of like making things more conscious? Um, the, the, the farthest I can get, and I kind of want you to extend what I'm about to say, the farthest I get is it's almost like you're like lovingly holding on to your fears in a steady gaze instead of avoiding them. And then that might allow you to go deeper into the unconscious parts of the self in your model, or it allows the gatekeeper to, to open up. Am I on the right track there? Um, yeah. And if not, how, how would you modify that? So I think the model is helpful for, for any kind of practice that you use. The model could be helpful when you, people are debriefing it, right? So, um, so for example, I've started, I've done collect we space practice. So let's say you're doing we space practice and we start and then I'll tease people and I'll say, I know, you know, no one's saying anything. And I'm like, there's a lot going on in your mind. You're just gatekeeping it. Like, and people are like, yeah, right? So I don't call it shadow. I don't problematize it. <clears throat> we just, so that's the gatekeeper self. And then I do this practice, it's called, Reverse Bohmian dialogue. You know what Bohmian dialogue is? No. Okay, Bohmian dialogue is you sit around and you only speak from your highest self. This is what I think, if you really understand my model, it makes you realize how fucked up everything else is in, in truth. So Bohmian dialogue is, I go to this workshop and they say, let's just speak from our highest self. And then they say, everything's included. And I think, wait. Uh, if I speak from my highest self, 99% of my experience is excluded. Which one is it? And people say things like this all the time, and they don't even see that it's a complete bullshit setup. It's right. 
So Bohmian dialogue is you're supposed to speak only from your highest self. So I get into we space practice and I say, well, you're just gatekeeping. So you have to do it like on the second day because there's enough, you have to have enough trust and people are so exhausted, they do anything. They don't give a shit anymore. So I say, we're gonna agree. We're gonna do it for three minutes. This helps people take a chance. And so there, and I say, and everything that comes up, as soon as it comes up, you're just gonna speak it. No more gatekeeping, none. Everybody agrees. Everyone has to say, yes, I agree, right? What do you think happens? Well, what do you think people think is gonna happen? They get, why are they really nervous? Because they've been thinking all kinds of bad things about everybody and they just agreed to say this as soon as it comes up. So what happens when people do this exercise? They're so vigilant, no thoughts come up. Because as soon as the thought comes up, they go to express it and it discharges the energy of the thought. Now they understand how to stop their busy mind because you can feel it as a proto thought in your stomach and you can work with it in your body before it's all this meandering, this and that. And I guess, you know, I can't show you that this model made that thing perfectly clear, but to answer your question, I think the first step is to know what's under the hood. I think people are doing psychotechnologies and they don't know what's under the hood. I think Buddhistic practices have no fucking clue how the human works in, in many cases. Not, not like Lee, Lee Brasington. He says, oh, you know, you do this and you're manipulating the opioid system. This is somebody who knows how the, the, you know, that the ankle bone is connected to the leg bone, right? This is someone who knows that. So um, just three bullets that I'm taking away from that. Sorry, for, I know. No, that's, that's great. Yeah. For, for a BSD context is, I can see this as a good tool for um, first coming up with life practices because you can kind of diagnose yourself and, and be like, you know what? Maybe I should focus more on embodiment practices or something like that. I can also see this as a good tool for diagnosing whether or not you designed your practice as well. So after maybe you, you try it out for a couple of weeks and then you, you know, something fails or a lot of resistance comes up, you can kind of look back at this and see what was I neglecting. And then what you just said, I think can be really useful for the group practices where maybe there are techniques in order to dilate the, the gates of the gatekeeper so that people can cohere a little bit more together. I have um, one more question and then I'll hand it back to Peter to field some from the audience, but something that came up earlier is um, it's clear that we're, we're we, that whole human pickle of, of like trying to be authentic in the face of the culture is, is, it's a huge challenge. And we also are the culture, right? So I, I wonder, I, I, I asked it this way in the chat, but I feel like this question is not the best formulation of it. In, in a culture that actively alienates us from our nature, how do we achieve alignment across that vertical dimension without changing the culture? Um, I mean, I can explain it with, by elucidating the model. Um, it's, it depends. Um, this is, uh, culture is going to change anyways. I mean, it's, you know, because, because of this latency, because these energies that get, when I was young, you knew, we knew there were girls that were lesbians, they got married, they had kids, but you knew they were lesbians. And, and this kind of energy, you cannot hold it back. You can't hold back that culture is going to change. It's just painful for people and painful for a lot of people. So, we, so knowing that that's, you know, this model is called the generative self. The self is doing this anyways. It's generating, it's generative, it's got this latency about it. And so the question is, um, these categories, I, me, mine, we, us, as you move through them, the way you think culture change moves also. So for example, in, in the uh, pre-modern 
these lower structures, you just think yourself is pre-constituted by the culture. You would never ask that question. Mm. In the modern era, we had people like Carnegie's and the Queen of Spain, these that the that the individual was the agent that changed the culture. This is true. A few captains of industry could change the culture. Now those times have gone. This is not possible anymore. So then you have to change. You see this now in postmodern modernism. They see the self as the locus of agency that changes the collective. So you have activism, right? So that would be like an activism. But then what we're seeing in metamodern is that the self is the locus of transformation that evolves other selves. So you get out of the postmodern trap and that's what BSD is doing. You're not really focused on the culture. You're saying the locus of transformation of the culture is how do we evolve this, how do selves evolve each other? So you've got more of this direct link like you did in modernity, bunch of captains of industry. You don't have this postmodern activism. And that's, that's what these, what you and Peter are moving into, this different way of answering this we question, okay? Then there's another one coming online and you start to see the self as the locus of transformation that evolves the collective. And this is for people who have, Martin Luther King is one of these people, that he had a certain type of self that evolved the whole collective. So this is on the other side of the one we're in now, which is the metamodern, that the self is seen as the locus of transformation that evolves the self. That's beautiful. So, yeah, it's an interesting question. It comes in the model, this move, I, me, mine, we, us, they come with the collective, the sense of the we, us evolves along with that. So, um, yeah, it's a great question, and I, I'm very happy you, you recognized yourself in that movement. Awesome. Thanks, Daniel. Um, yeah, let's get some other voices in here. Uh, mm -hmm. The next person I'll take in, I'll, I'll plug her event uh, first. Uh, she's coming to the STOA on November 10th, uh, in a session called Awakening the Subtle Body Embodiment Practice, so you can have a sense of... Um, you know what her interest space is. Uh, Skylar Brown, uh, can you ask your question to Benita? Thank you. Um, hi, Bonnie. Um, this has been so fun, and my mind is really blown. Um, and I've seen this before, so <laughs> it just keeps it keeps deeper. Um, the question I have, and it feels like um, maybe some others were plus wanting this. Um, where does imagination? work or what is the role of imagination um yeah. i imagine or the way i experience it is in working with those with the trajectory that the the deepening of the trajectory downward the embodiment piece mm -hmm. but i'm curious if it sort of flows throughout the model or yeah would love to hear you on that yeah so <clears throat> the thing is is when the mind is liberated and the psyche is individuated they no longer act like the kind of mind we have or like the kind of psyche I complain about. And the psyche becomes, is the imagine, it's imaginative. So you've heard me complain about we space practice because if you keep on looking at the psyche in a certain way, it infinitely imagines more and more structures and more and more, there's, there's no end to it. But people think that's in them rather than say, ah, how can I use this skill and imagine, you know, like the totem, we imagine different orientations to the world. That's all very psychic, uh, but it's not filled with just creating structures you're identifying or disidentifying with. What you're very aware is that it is the function of um, the imagination. And it can partner with, when it partners with a mind that's not, completely conditioned, then you can do things like create new theories of change because you've imagined worlds and they can partner that, that way. 
um, yeah, so that's where it would be. It, um, but, you know, and that's, of course, young, you know, the, the psyche becomes imaginal um, and not <clears throat> instead of filled with imaginary structures. Um, but of course, it's all connected because this imagination of the psyche or the predictive virtual reality playing of the mind, if it's disembodied, is not aligned. You don't have alignment. I'm going to give voice to the second part of the question that's coming up in the chat, which is about intimacy. Ari is asking about intimacy. Depends what you mean by yeah, intimacy. Yeah, I think we might have to elaborate on um, that. Intimacy comes with the uh, neuroaffective affect, you know, neurodynamic affect streams. Intimacy and grief uh, are part of the same. Grief is the loss of someone you're intimate with. Um, these are um, part of our animal nature. Um, yeah, these are part of our animal nature, but they get more sophisticated. Um, and it depends what you mean by intimacy. You know, there's a lot of ways to read that. Um, Ari, do you wanna jump in and uh, add on your question? Yeah, thanks. Um, I guess my, how I mean intimacy is, I'm not sure, I'm kind of on a riff right now, inquiring about it. And my intuition is that it, relates as you say it can get more sophisticated over time and that that like dot of intimacy could move around and i also intuit that it has something a close relation with the gatekeeper in any given moment so i would love to hear yeah so intimacy i would say is a state it's it could be a um, I feel like fusion or merging, who's self and who's other. Um, the more intimate something is, the, the more, the less boundary there is between self and other. Um, if you're intimate with something, you could be intimate with a thing and when it breaks, it hurts you, you know? Like, so to me, intimacy is this larger embrace of, of, uh, of care, a larger sphere of care but it's associated with a bodily reaction to feel intimate with something is in your body. Um, it's, it's, and then of course, like everything else, um, um, one of the things about these, these emotional states, if you wanna say that, or these affect states is that they're complex. So for example, if you flood your system with oxytocin, like um, if you see a little fawn walk into the room, you start to feel, oh, and you, it, it just, oxytocin comes in. And they did this experiment in prison where they're like, well, why don't we just give prisoners oxytocin to reduce the violence? But oxytocin creates intimacy, which means the mother bear loves the child and any foreigner gets fucked with. It comes with that action, action logics also, because intimacy is both inclusive in a sphere of care and extremely exclusive outside of it. So if you're intimate with your partner, <laughs> you don't want anyone in your life, right? So, so these all come from the animal body, but as humans, we can use our minds and our identity project and our spirituality to increase our sphere of care and understand it comes with this exclusionary thing and rewire that it's a compassion. So you're compassionate. You really work with your body. So the state of intimacy is in one direction and not the other. And that's the care, the larger spheres of care. Can I be intimate with a stranger? Can I blend so much with emp empathic, like uh, can I have empathic projection onto an animal? So intimacy is in the body, but then 
the range for polar bear, it's not very big. Um, for people, we seem to be able to create larger spheres of, of embrace of intimacy. Any quick follow-up share, Ari? Yeah, I would, I, that's amazing. Um, one way we collectively seem to use intimacy is emotional intimacy of sharing what is real in real time. And I would love to hear you kind of map that specific piece. <clears throat> You mean like not having a gatekeeper self? Um, like, what do you mean by real? Like values or? It's almost how I've been kind of thinking about intimacy lately is almost being able to share what the witness sees as opposed to just, uh, you know, like something that Schmachtenberger would talk about as like weaponized honesty. Um, yeah, so I, I think I can. So you have a you have a certain in, inner inner reality that's hard to share, and because and and what I'm hearing you saying is like when when you intimacy is both moving into a position where it's shareable and a kind of connection where that transmission happens in a kind of sometimes without a lot of words. And then all of a sudden you might feel very intimate because your inner world, your, what you're witnessing is somehow now, uh, we talk about it in the, in the pop-up school, like you're working on a jam board and someone all of a sudden is working on their jam board. And then at some point you realize it's just one jam board in your, in your inner life. And that brings that I would say is also makes your body feel intimate because intimacy has to do with this lack of boundary between self and other. So whether it's a physical boundary, whether it's a mental witnessing or these ways in which you can come up with ideas with like a lot of, I've done like we space practice with like Jordan Hall and there's a point at which like before someone says something, it's very intellectual, it's like, you're in their mind and they're in your mind and you're working with the same working memory. You got, you're working on the same jam board and that makes you feel very intimate. So in this sense, the porosity is through the intellect or whatever you want to call it versus maybe, you know, the, the, the body actually, but the body, you feel intimate. There's a, and so that's what I think intimacy is this. And that comes in when I said the core self, is always trying to figure out self, other, and world. And it changes because when you're intimate, you're like, well, whose mind is it? Whose body is it? Is that the world or is that my projection on the world? And this is a lively project that it's not resolvable. Um, and, and I think that's part of my answer to you. I don't know if it nailed it or something, but somewhere around there is that. Totally nailed it. Thank you so much. And to briefly plug Ari's podcast, it's really fucking good. I recommend checking out. I would love to have a, to see a, or hear a conversation with Benita and Ari on his podcast. Um, so we're approaching the end of the hour or end of the ninety minutes. Um, there's one question I wanted to sneak in, but do you have to? Do you have a hard stop, B? Um, no, I'm open. Okay. Let's I'm just, just getting on a roll because you know I've been up since two o'clock and yeah. now I've passed that threshold where it just feels like easy street and the, the body's just doing what it's doing. Beautiful, beautiful. So so we'll have one more question. Uh, if you have to slip out now, feel free to. This will be on the Stoa's YouTube channel if you if you want to catch it there. And uh, for the last question, we'll take in uh, another embodied witch from the high pitch series, uh, Eche. Uh, Eche, if you can ask me your question. Hey, thank you. Um, after being away from the store for months, this is my first, and um, I feel a lot of intimacy. That last um, conversation brought up the connection between intimacy, and my original question was about 
the vertical alignment and the horizontal coherence and about the relationship uh, of those two. And even more specifically, what do you mean by coherence? And as you guys were jiving about intimacy, I was getting a sense that coherence actually relates, at least in the way I understand, alignment to come, up, come online with intimacy. I'm just throwing things at you. You can go wherever you want. Yeah, so by coherence, I just mean we could take the simple definition of it. In other words, when I speak to many different people, do I can I be coherent in the in conversation with many different people? So a Trump, a Democrat, a Trump supporter, and a Hillary supporter, they can't be coherent with each other. They just they can't embrace the collective that is U.S. people, right? So coherence is to is just. I can be coherent in my family. Okay, yeah, they get me. Can I be coherent in my workplace? Well, yeah, but maybe I'm fighting with that person. I can't enter into their reality. So how, that's what coherence means. Like you can, you can commune with them. You can communicate in a coherent way. So um, this would be harder to do if, and, and so what happens is if you're trying to be coherent with other cultures and you call female genitalia uh, mutilation, female genitalia mutilation, and you call uh, circumcision circumcision, it's going to be hard to be coherent in certain cultures because you've created a split between this is genital mutilation and this is circumcision. And you put the one version into a bad category and you put the other version into the good category. So I can't be coherent across those cultures until I figure out why do cultures mutilate genitals? As humans, that's what we do. We mutilate genitals, okay? Now I just can try to, this is the depth image. I gotta come to terms with that. It's not like, that's a bad version. This is a good version that's culturally conditioned. I need to get underneath the phenomenon of culture itself. Once I can do that, then I can be coherent. I can say in both situations, you know, that I'm really uncomfortable with that because for me, and there's no charge to it, I'm coherent with my expression across both those cultures. I mean, I had this conversation with someone in my class and she's like, well, but some culture, you know, that she just couldn't see any relationship between female genital mutilation and circumcision. She just couldn't be coherent across that good, bad thing. So you can't have a real relationship or conversation across those cultures. You see this in like, this is a problem with, you know, to everybody trying to build a coherent politics. Well, to build a coherent politics, you can't bias one side or the other. So I was in a conversation with the integral political group in Europe and they, so I said, well, what do you do? They say, well, we put out brochures to try to get people to vote this way and not that way. I said, well, that's, that's a cool job, but it's not integral. Like, so they were, they wanted people to vote for the Clean Water Act and the, and the like, because the farmers don't want to do it. I said, the farmers don't want dirty water any more than you want dirty water. They're not a bunch of idiots. That, oh, I'm going to vote for like po poisonous water. So it's not coherent. It's not coherent across that conversation. It's just biased. They were imagining farmers as being bad, stupid people who wanted dirty water. It's completely incoherent. Con the conversation is not coherent. So, <clears throat> so you need to do some examination of your culture in order to then embrace the larger, to be coherent in the larger scale. And so that's what I mean by coherence. Um, and 
The problem with this model, I mean, if you, maybe it's because I'm tired, is it really makes you despair. Because like, there's, there's not a lot of coherence. There's not a lot of embodiment. There's not, a, almost everybody leads with their me in our culture. Um, and so, so the model is, is you know, it, it, it's a loud voice. It speaks loudly. There's so well, many people, like, blah, 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 in spiritual communities, and they don't even lead, they lead with their me still. It's not possible to be liberated and enlightened when you're leading with your me. Or if you still have mommy and daddy issues, it's not possible. These are very, very, very primitive parts of the human condition, which is okay. We have to deal with them, but deal with those. As the woman from Sounds True, she said about Andrew Cohen, he, she's like, for God's sakes, get over your mommy issues first before you go out and teach enlightenment. That's kind of the energy behind the model. That's how I bark at my students. Well, I, I love that it's highlighting embodiment as the gateway uh, and as a process to move forward. And um, again, why intimacy did light up for me or in which context it, it did light up for me was exactly in that intimacy with further intimacy with self, with the inner self, with the subtle self, increasing in intimacy with the subtle self then allows that expansion for me to come and talk to a Trump voter and not be hold my ground in a nice way. Nice meaning like not triggered. Um, yeah, and so this, this, uh, this phrase intimacy with yourself is interesting because we talked about intimacy as losing boundaries, right? And so to me, if you're intimate with yourself, then these structures, like this is the good girl, this is the bad girl, this is this, they, they, they would tend to become more holistic, I would say, because you're not, the whole understanding of intimacy is that things aren't so separate, separated. Uh, the forces are aligned. There's a seamless communication. So that's an interesting way to use this notion of intimacy. <clears throat> awesome. Thank you, uh, Ache. Um, so I sense this is a good place to close. Uh, like, this, is, this is what like, I probably one of my favorite sessions I've, I've had since the store started. Uh, so fucking good. And I think we're going to have to spend a lot of time with this session and just I'm going to watch this video again and again. And then um, perhaps we can have some kind of uh, study groups and how this can be integrated to the BSD process. Um, but B, do you have any closing thoughts uh, or words you'd like to leave us with? No, I think that, um, <clears throat> you know, I think that what's nice about the model is when it can confirm some of your your own instincts you know some of your own instincts about skepticism on one hand but that this may be the way to go um and um and i think that with clarity and confirmation i think that transformation is is possible but and so so if it's a powerful operating system, then it'll get some convergence in some of these spaces and, and it'd be more, more powerful. But, you know, it's not complementary. It's, it's not meant to be complementary to everything. Um, you know, Wilbur is like, he starts with everybody is right. And I guess I start with everybody, everybody is wrong. Mm -hmm. Love it. You know, but I think that Everybody can fit in here. It's just that we need to be clear on, yeah, how what's under the hood. I think if we can have a, a an agreement on that, that's why I was happy when you brought in Lee Brasington. Like finally, someone who talks about the genres in a way that is not reductive but scientifically meaningful. Also, you know. So, um, yeah. 
So thank you for letting give me the time to uh, to share it, and hopefully, yeah, it's hopefully it's useful. Yeah, uh, I think um, just from uh, feeling the room, the field, and the, the shares in the chat, I think it was very, very useful. Um, so I'll make some closing announcement in a moment, but Daniel, any closing uh, words on your end? No, I'm just, uh, I guess I'll just like re reassert my optimism. I, I don't think this is a, a pessimistic take at all, even though, yes, you know, 80% of 90% of the world is coming from a me orientation. Maybe that's not good, but I feel very optimistic after this session. Same. Yeah, I feel, feel, I feel fired up with fucking Fathumos. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah. You know, and can I just say something? Whoops. Hello? Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. So the thing is, like, every time Peter writes in one of his epic journals, I don't give a fuck about status. He doesn't lead with his me. You see, this makes a difference. Nope. This is not leading with your me. And so you can notice, I think this is also good for the model. I have other things you can notice. Ah, yeah, that's a sign. And of course, now we understand why in some people it can be interpreted as narcissistic, right? Now you see that wobble. So how can you tell? Is he a narcissist or is he someone that leads with his eye? These are important distinctions to make, discernments that you can make. Uh knife edge of narcissism feel free to read my journals um my favorite uh, stoic quote uh, from epictetus and i think it's daniel's too don't explain your philosophy embody it um which nicely sets up skylar's uh, session coming up at the stoa which you can check out the stoa.ca um so yeah we'll close out here uh, awesome session thank you benita thank you daniel thank you everyone from the pop-up school and beyond self-discipline do check out benita's uh, sub stack where you can sign up for the um pop-up school and yeah, let's go fucking get it. Let's go create the new world, steal the culture, heal it, do it what we have to do. Um, so sending everyone lots of love and gratitude, and we'll close out with uh, our Thumos-inspired theme song for PSD.